even among younger black folk that are stable, you know, like pretty good jobs, I put myself in this category, we're no longer going to be okay if most of us are left behind. You came on a lot of people's radar last year when Jonathan Wiseman, the Washington deputy editor of the New York Times, said that you were going to try to unseat an African-American incumbent. And you pointed out, hey, I'm black too. Yeah. What was going through your mind as this was happening? What did that speak to? It's surreal to have your racial identity discussed on Twitter, uh, especially when probably a week before that, no one really knew who I was. But also it's like, wow, I mean, this guy doesn't seem to have an understanding of the diversity within the black community. Weird. And has the real influence to perpetuate a very dangerous narrative that by presenting a different policy position against a sitting black member of Congress, you are somehow a threat to black representation. Well, I'm coming at this from a deep love and experience within the black community, and I think that's what speaks to folks in the third district is, she's one of us. Can you speak to what you see as like the current like generation gap with black voters? Because you know, when you really just look at polls and they say the black vote's doing this, black vote's doing that, I sometimes hear this and I'm like, oh, is that the black vote or is that maybe the black vote for people perhaps like 55 or older. Our race is unique in the sense that, you know, it's a very safe gerrymandered Democratic district. The incumbent whom I'm running against is an older black woman. I am a younger black woman. Now let's have a conversation about policy. And to me, what does that look like? Healthcare. Everybody deserves to have healthcare. Police brutality. I mean, this is an issue that is also a big priority of folks living in Columbus. And I do feel like we're at a crossroads where a lot of younger black folk are not feeling like the older generation is sensing the urgency that we all are feeling and and that we're willing to organize around but you know we've got to we've got to be real and have a conversation about what are we seeing in our communities and what policies are going to address the issues millennials are not you know a bunch of 20 year olds anymore. Kids. Yeah, yeah the oldest yeah. millennials are like 30 pushing 40. yes and these are people with families yeah. who want more mm -hmm. for themselves and their communities. Can you speak more to the rejection of like cynicism you see? Like when I first launched, people were like, oh, who is this girl? Who does she think she is? And it's like, well, I'm 36 years old. I've been a working professional for like 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it's a way to dismiss and minimize what we're saying, what our generation is speaking to. We've done the analysis, we've had the jobs, and we see that what we're doing isn't working. The status quo of Washington is not serving us. And we are not going to accept another 20 years of endless wars that don't take us anywhere while we're spending resources that we could be putting into folks having health care. It's like, no, we are rejecting this, this old school style that puts profit and corporations over people. We're seeing that we are able to mount campaigns without that corporate PAC money. We are able to organize through social media and build momentum and communicate with folks that have traditionally not engaged in politics. And once you start to activate people to care about politics, well, a lot of this system does start to crumble because it relies on low voter turnout.